I'd like to welcome Vicki Cox. Vicki is a senior research analyst at Charity Entrepreneurship, leading its animal welfare research. She's joined the Charity Entrepreneurship team after completing the incubation program in 2019. Before Charity Entrepreneurship, she studied maths with actuarial science at the University of Southampton, where she helped to found an effective altruism society. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming to the talk today. I'm going to keep my section brief so we can get to our lovely lightning talks. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd just kind of introduce why I think talking about this topic is important and how we can do, go about doing so. So yeah, kind of talking about this today and bringing new cause areas to you all to kind of give you the social permission to evaluate and start thinking about cause areas outside of the traditional EA box. When you look at EA, I think we have the big three, global poverty, animal welfare, and long-termism, existential risk, um, and that's kind of always been the case, which seems strange to, strange to me. So yeah, we should start thinking about new cause areas. Um, we're also, at the end, going to give you a bit of direction on how to start evaluating new cause areas, and then, yeah, going to hear from people yeah, working on new cause areas, which I think is the main reason we're all here and excited. So yeah, why do I think it's important for us to explore new cause areas? So yeah, if we think about the big three, really, they're a somewhat historical accident as to why they're the cause areas that EA is focused on. It was kind of the early movers in the EA space that came up with these ideas, and we haven't really thought much about this. We've kind of accepted this as the accepted cause areas in EA. Um, but the evidence supporting these areas is often somewhat arbitrary, yeah, based on an arbitrary starting point rather than analysis of all the possible cause areas, um, which seems strange to me in a movement that's kind of like, very obsessed with evidence. You know, we look at GiveWell trying to optimize intervention level, but we don't do the same for calls every year level. Um, and that, yeah, I think should change. And yeah, the space of unexplored clauses is huge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we have many, many different cause areas outside of the top three that have high potential for impact, and we're going to hear about that in our lightning talks. And I think as a community, we want to be doing multiple things. I think a, the good thing about EA as a movement is that we care about maximizing impact. We don't care where that impact comes from, who has that impact. We just want to maximize it. And it seems strange to me that we're limiting ourselves to more normal cause areas um, to do that maximization. And instead, we should be thinking about yeah, how we can innovate and maximize our impact outside of the, the top three cause areas, as you will. I guess a caveat, I'm not saying we should throw everything out of the water and only focus on new things. And I think, you know, the top charities in the space of these big three are still going to be very hard to beat, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and we shouldn't be doing this, like, exploratory approach. Um, yeah, so when we look at new cause areas, what approach do I think we should take? I think rather than diving into new areas completely, instead we should be looking at like an exploratory approach building on things that we already know. So taking global health as one of the big three as an example. There's kind of many ways to build off that as a cause area. We can zoom in and talk about neonatal and maternal health. Maybe we could slightly broaden the scope but still have it overlap. So look at agriculture or high income policies that impact low income countries. And then maybe we can take a step even further, looking at economic growth, governance, interventions. And yeah, really iterating depth and looking deeper and deeper, the more promising cause areas look. Um, I guess an example of how we've done this at Charity Entrepreneurship, um, we've kind of zoomed in to global health to look at neonatal mortality, family planning, and then we've found Family Empowerment Media, Maternal Health Initiative, and then looking at those approaches, we think family planning is a really promising cause area that we're likely to return to again and again. And then also learning from an iterative approach that Family Empowerment Media have taken. Now we're looking at mass media as a cause area for new charities across the global health space. So kind of testing one charity, seeing that it works. Cool, that's an update that family planning is a promising cause area. Then looking at their approach, seeing that works. Cool, that's an update that mass media is a promising approach to tackle a subject. And yeah, kind of iteratively uh, applying like this rigor to cause areas as well as interventions. So now I'll pass you over to our lightning talks. Um, so we're going to have five lightning talks. The first um, on congenital syphilis, then on volcano risks, 
then trade law for animals, biodiversity, and finally family planning and mass media. And then I'll jump on just at the end uh, to talk about get questions you might want to consider when looking at a new cause area and trying to evaluate it. So first we have uh, Kea from Healthy Futures Global. Kea is a co-founder of an organization recently incubated by charity entrepreneurship that works to eliminate mother to child transmission of syphilis. Before co-founding co Healthy Futures, Kea was a doctor working in emergency medicine with further experience in bioethics and research. Kea is going to be touching on congenital syphilis and how mother to child transmission of syphilis can be prevented at scale very cost effectively. Hand over to Kea. Imagine you were born intellectually disabled, blind, deaf, with bone deformities, all because your mother had a disease in her pregnancy that she couldn't get tested or treated for. What a senseless tragedy. That's what Healthy Futures Global is working to prevent. Syphilis isn't a disease we hear very much about, but it's still a big problem in global health. Along with causing lifelong disability, it can cause neonatal death and stillbirth. Every year, 60,000 newborns die because of congenital syphilis, and 140,000 children are born stillborn. That makes syphilis the second largest cause of stillbirths in the world. What's encouraging here is how much of the solution is already in place. It's not a problem of access to healthcare. Globally, 86% of women get to see a healthcare worker at least once during their pregnancy. Effective treatments also exist for syphilis. A single injection of penicillin can cure it and stop it passing from a mother to her child. The problem really is in the testing for syphilis. There are many countries around the world which have a high burden of syphilis in pregnancy, but very low testing rates for it. All of these countries fall far below the WHO's recommendation of testing 95% of pregnant women for syphilis. Our solution here is to leverage the existing infrastructure around another disease in pregnancy, HIV. Globally, testing rates for HIV in pregnancy are way higher than they are for syphilis, and that's driven in large part by these guys, rapid tests. These are finger prick blood tests that give a result in 15 minutes and cost less than a dollar. And here's the exciting part. New versions of these tests can diagnose both HIV and syphilis. Our approach is going to be working with governments to transition from using the HIV-only tests to the dual tests, and by doing so, elevate syphilis testing rates to the much higher HIV testing rates. The evidence around this intervention is very strong. On the testing side, the WHO endorsed the use of these dual tests in 2019. They detect over 90% of cases of syphilis. And studies in 11 low- and middle-income countries have shown that transitioning from HIV-only tests to syphilis tests uh, significantly increases the rate of syphilis testing in pregnancy. On the treatment side of things, a single injection of penicillin reduces 97% of the risk of transmission from a pregnant woman to her child. It also reduces the chance of stillbirth or death by 82%. Now, this data on treatment is from observational studies. Penicillin is so good that you can't run RCTs on it because it would be unethical to withhold it from a control group. Our analysis suggests that this intervention would be about 9 to 11 times as cost effective as direct cash transfers. If we can achieve this, this would put us on par with GiveWell's top recommended charities. How we plan to go about achieving this is to work with governments on every step of the way to transitioning from the HIV-only tests to the dual tests and treating pregnant women if they're diagnosed. That might be lobbying governments to switch over to the new tests, helping them draft new guidelines so that their health workers know how to use and interpret them. Importantly, it's going to be helping procurement, getting enough supplies of these tests into the country from manufacturers and distributing them to the clinics where they're needed. We're going to support the training of health workers to reuse the new tests. And we're also going to work with governments to secure long-term funding plans so that this can be a sustainable intervention for them. Now, the theme of these talks is around unusual or off-the-beaten-track paths to cost-effectiveness. And our approach is finding a strong system that's already in place and adding impactful interventions to that. In our case, it's around HIV. There are already strong supply chains getting these tests to the clinics. 
Health workers are trained on how to use the rapid tests, and lots and lots of pregnant women already attend antenatal clinics. We're just adding on syphilis testing and treatment to this already strong system, and we want to repeat this again in the future. They're working on a triple test, which can also detect hepatitis B, another disease that can pass from pregnant women to their children. Now, testing and treating for syphilis and hepatitis B might not be cost effective or impactful on their own if we had to build all this infrastructure from the ground up. But because it's already in place, adding them onto these existing systems can be very impactful. So if you're looking to find unusual paths to cost effectiveness, one approach is to find an existing strong system, maybe with one weak link, and fixing that weak link or adding new interventions on. And if you want to have a really cost-effective impact, help us out. <laughs> After EA Global, my co-founder Niels and I are heading to Tanzania and the Philippines as the two most promising countries for us to start working in. So if you know people there or you know people in global health organizations who could be useful for us to talk to, please get in touch. Or, of course, if you'd like to volunteer your time or your skills, we'd love to hear from you. You can talk to us via our website, healthyfutures.global. Come grab us during the conference or find me during the office hours after this talk. Together, let's make syphilis a thing of the past and build healthier futures so that all children can be born hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Kea. Up next, we have Lara, who's a senior research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, where she focuses on effective communication methods to address global catastrophic risks. By providing empirical evidence, her research aims to increase awareness of these global catastrophic risks among policymakers, civil society, industry, and the public. Laura's background is in volcanic risk communication and establishing an evidence-based practice for the education and communication of volcanic hazards, particularly within the Caribbean region. Laura will be talking about volcano risks as a neglected area within existential risk. Laura. Um, okay, so thanks very much everyone. So um, some of you might be a little bit aware of this. We've posted a few posts on the EA forum, so um, let me indulge you in the world of volcanoes. So um, first of all, how are we thinking about volcanic eruptions in EA? So in 2013, OpenPhil did a shallow dive, um, and much of this investigation now is really outdated. They spoke to one volcanologist, one economist, um, and unfortunately they came out with that volcanoes are really low priority. Um, otherwise, all fed are thinking a little bit about volcanic eruptions in terms of sunlight blocking catastrophes, but otherwise no one has been really thinking about volcanic eruptions at all. Um, and here's why I think that this is a neglected but tractable uh, uh, cause area. So volcanic eruptions pose a sunlight blocking catastrophe, um, risk of sunlight blocking catastrophe. So uh, this cartoon kind of depicts this perfectly well. So when a volcanic eruption happens, it releases lots of gas that gets lofted up into our upper atmosphere. And that sulfate gas uh, mixes with water in the atmosphere to produce an aerosol which begins to reflect sunlight back out into space and reduces the sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. As a result, we can get climatic feedbacks and uh, global surface cooling. Um, and this can be really catastrophic for our global food productions uh, and networks. In this space, the best part about working on volcanoes is I get to Google lots of really extreme photos, so <laughs> just let me indulge you. Um, so the dominant narrative in this space is that a super volcano is going to erupt and it's going to kill us all. Uh, there's many problems with this, and I'm going to kind of unpack this. So first of all, this is um, a, a very high, uh, high um, kind of impact event, what we call a VEI-8, so that's the scale in which we measure volcanic eruptions on, it's a magnitude uh, and it's a logarithmic scale. And these are incredibly rare and they're about, depending on which volcanologist you ask, between every 1,000 to 10,000 years, more towards the 10,000. The last one was 25 and a, 26 and a half thousand years ago in uh, Torpo in uh, New Zealand, the Oranui eruption, and we've not had one since. Um, Toby Ord uh, suggests that eruptions of this kind of scale, of what we would, uh, a toba was a, an example of that, you might have heard of the bottleneck of humanity, whether that's true or false, um, and that he, he puts an estimate at one in 8,000 uh, per century, kind of based on these figures from volcanologists. And now I'm gonna tell you why that's wrong. The reality. <laughs> so eruptions uh, are, are even of smaller magnitude should be considered in this conversation. It's not a linear relationship that the larger the eruption, the more gas it produces. Actually, smaller magnitude eruptions of even 
two, two times uh, smaller can actually have the same gas release that can cause this climatic feedbacks. Um, and these eruptions are really frequent. So if we even account for just one scale less, what we call a VEI7 on that logarithmic scale, they have a frequency of once every 625 years. Um, and they can be absolutely catastrophic for our global food production. That's, that global surface cooling really significantly affects the northern hemisphere where much of our crops are grown. And estimates suggest that we could lose a calorific intake for up to 2.9 billion people in an event of such a catastrophe. Um, and actually, that puts this at a one in six per century chance of a large magnitude eruption causing such chaos. And the other thing is that we're vulnerable. So that's talking about through the, the lens of hazard, but if we look at through the lens of vulnerability, actually our world is more interconnected and interwoven than ever before. And this comes from a paper that we published um, a few years ago, which you'll please, please go and find. Um, and we now in our societies rely on a whole myriad of systems and networks to sustain us, to keep us ticking and to keep us developing. And that includes things like submarine cables, transportation and trade networks, um, and you know, the, the transportation of goods and commodities that keep us, keep us going. And unfortunately, uh, many of these are clustered in <laughs> narrow geographical regions um, based on where our populations are centered. And actually, many of these are in regions in close proximity to volcanic eruptions, um, even ones of relatively small magnitudes, of what we call three to six, so even really down on that, on that scale, that logarithmic scale. And so we produced this, this map, although I would majorly expand this since, and more and more I've thought about this, and what we, called, what we termed global pinch points. So these are regions in our world where we have a heightened societal vulnerability in proximity to volcanic, volcanic regions of volcanic activity. So those are places like the Pacific Northwest, where we have the Cascades Range, we have Seattle, responsible for 2.5% of you know, all US imports, um, and places like the Straits of Malacca, which is responsible for the, the transportation of 60% of global trade, uh, and 14, 14 submarine cables there that connect Asia to the rest of the world. And of course, we have the entire island uh, arc of, of Indonesia with over 100 volcanoes. Um, so how prepared are we for an event like this? How prepared are we to deal with volcanic eruptions? And I, you can guess what I'm going to say. Not very. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be preaching to you. So and I have to talk about this eruption. The Hunga Tonga Hunga Harpe eruption in January 2020 um, is the highest intensity eruption we have ever recorded with modern instruments. This was really a shock event for volcanology and something we're still learning from today. Um, it, luckily for us, released very little amount of sulfate content. And we think it's because it was a submarine eruption, so it was below the water level. Um, but something, uh, uh, you know, this is just one teragram, whereas uh, the Pinatubo 1991, for context, is 20 ter ter uh, teragrams of, of sulfate gas. The peak, the, the plume uh, punched through into our mesosphere, the highest ever plume we've ever measured, 55 kilometers, and it took up a whole bunch of water with it, which was a mechanism we never knew before. So, you know, we're really in the nascence of learning about volcanoes and their impacts on our world. Um, and one of the reasons I think we should care about this eruption is I think it's a shock. It's this kind of, it's the Chelyabinsk of the volcano world. Had this eruption gone on for five to seven days, we might have seen a VI7. 50 to 60, we'd have been seeing a VI8. And then on the impacts of this eruption, it's the first time we've ever seen a country go dark, absolutely dark in the aftermath of the eruption. We knew nothing about what was happening on the ground in Tonga. We didn't know if it was a mass loss of life or what their impacts would be. We had no, no global plans for food security in place for this type of sunlight blocking catastrophe. The humanitarian sector was vastly underprepared and had no kind of idea how to respond to such an event. There was no coordination globally on sharing of data. Unfortunately, Volcanology relies on Twitter. Somebody please help us. Um, <laughs> and we had no global monitoring, surveillance, or even early warning systems. So this is a, there's a lot of work to do in this space, um, and we're trying to start making, uh, making waves. So we're actually creating a nonprofit, which hopefully you'll hear about in the coming weeks. Um, and we're trying to build societal resilience to volcanic eruptions. So this is working closely with stakeholders, and we're hoping to have a secondment into one of the UN organizations uh, in this area. We need to do lots more modeling of crop and climatic impacts from large magnitude eruptions to understand the worst case scenarios. We need to take a really interdisciplinary approach to understanding what this might look like in terms of the systemic and the cascading impacts on volcanic eruptions on our global in infrastructure and systems. And we also need to be pushing much harder on policy and trying to drive this onto the, the agenda. For example, we're not even covered by a UN agency right now. 
Okay, so I hope I've gone a little way in convincing you that we should be a little bit more worried about volcanoes, but that there is some hope, <laughs> at least. Thanks very much. Up next, we have Alex, who's working with Natural England, and will be talking about eco-resilience via biodiversity as a neglected component of maintaining a livable planet for humanity. I shouldn't be here. My background is in environmental science, and it's a given day one lesson that climate and biodiversity are inextricably linked, and that they're at least as important as each other in terms of maintaining that livable planet that we want. So why is it then that there are no EA-affiliated organizations at all focused on this specific issue, whereas climate is fairly well serviced? At the moment, this is where biodiversity in EA starts and ends. Myself and a few of my now colleagues in the eco-resilience group tried and kept chasing our tails when we were trying to find the, what must be this group of really intelligent, productive people working on this super important issue, but there truly is nothing, and we need to change that. So let's define our terms. Biodiversity is simply the variety of life on Earth across scales. This includes the microbes and the crawlers that aren't very charismatic, all the way up to on the scale of the biosphere. Something that's maybe less well understood that I want to draw your attention to is down in the bottom left-hand corner. So within species and within populations of species, you have genetic diversity. And this is extremely important because it's this genetic diversity that allows populations to adapt and respond to change. Biodiversity matters fundamentally because it's Earth's life support system. It creates and maintains the conditions for itself and it enables our societies and economies to thrive. There are also many other intrinsic reasons to care about this, cultural and moral ones, but I don't have time to cover that in this lightning talk. So what does it do for us? A whole awful lot. Everything from filtering water, ensuring that reliable rainfall ends up where it's supposed to be, the climate being predictable, soils being fertile enough to grow crops, the list goes on and on. For that reason, our economy and everything that we do as a species cannot be viewed as something that exists separate to this planet and the biosphere. It's very much embedded within it. But to what extent? Something like 55% of GDP depends directly on ecological services. And goes without saying, but those ecological services are provided to us for free. They're so ubiquitous and they've existed throughout our whole history. And I think this is maybe why it's so easy to overlook them and just assume that they will continue indefinitely. But this is not the case. 20% of countries are currently at risk of their ecosystems degrading and collapsing. And these are not fair and evenly distributed uh, circumstances. Developing economies, which tend to depend more heavily on agricultural sectors, more directly linked to those ecological services, are much more severely affected when the environment starts to deteriorate. No matter what cause area you are focusing on, you would benefit greatly from having at least some awareness of the ecological context that your work takes place in. For some, the link is quite obvious, like food security and nutrition, but maybe the less obvious and less well understood ones are how X risks are multiplied by conflict and conflict and is driven by resource scarcity. Close your eyes for me, please. Imagine a machine. It doesn't require material con to construct. It's self-sustaining and self-maintaining and creates copies of itself. It's intelligent and it's a carbon capture machine. It works by fertilizing and churning the oceans. This boosts the rates of photosynthesis in phytoplankton. And rather than making waste at the end of its useful life, it locks away 33 tons of carbon permanently. If we rolled out this program, 1.7 billion tons of CO2 could be captured annually at a cost of just $13 per head. Open your eyes, please. I can reveal that this is, in fact, a biomechanical machine, better known as the whale. 
So this impact is ridiculously huge because of the scale of phytoplankton in terms of their contribution to carbon sequestration. So they are responsible for roughly four times that of the Amazon rainforest. So if helping whales to recover from this massive uh, catastrophe that we inflicted upon them about 100 years ago, if that could lead to just a 1% increase in that productivity, that's equivalent to 2 billion mature trees worth of sequestration every year. Whales are a prime example of a keystone species. So these are species that are extraordinarily important, more so than your, your average species. And this is because they engineer the ecosystem that they live in. This means that helping them to recover and survive can have outsized positive impacts, but losing them can be catastrophic. So the current state of biodiversity is not great. We're well into the red. We're crossing boundaries of uncertainty. And whilst the actual stat is two species per million per year going extinct, which doesn't sound very high, that is tens to hundreds of times the natural background that we expect based on the fossil record. The Earth is a complex system, and there are catastrophic tipping points out there. We're very confident about that, but where they are and how close we are to them, we really don't know. But extinction isn't the whole picture. Since the 70s, on average, species populations have more than halved. And a lot of these are nowhere near extinction. They're not classified as endangered yet, so why should we care? Well, because the size of the population is directly related to the genetic diversity within that population, and therefore its ability to adapt to change, such as climate change, or any other shock or stress that we may put upon it. Sometimes people think this is uh, not a neglected area, and it's true, people have been working in conservation since the 50s, roughly, but if what we were doing was working, would we be at in the uh, situation that we're in now? Unfortunately, we can't Jurassic Park our way out of it. This technology does not exist yet. And even if at some point in the future we might be able to revive a single species, a, a single uh, individual of an extinct species, making viable populations and then a whole web of, of the populations that make up an ecosystem would be significantly harder. So I think personally, that uh, much of what's led to this point is some of the areas where traditional conservation has fallen short. But thankfully, it's the unique strengths of the EA movement. So I think if we can operate on long-term long -term time horizons beyond 2050, beyond 2100, use common metrics to compare effectiveness between interventions, prioritize triage and plan for losses if necessary, and strategizing at the ecosystem and functional level then we can do great things. I would be willing to bet that most effective solutions would tend to fall in this top right quadrant. And at the moment, land conversion is the thing I'm most concerned about. Because of all threatened species, habitat loss is the main driver of extinction. This shouldn't surprise us because we're literally crowding everything out. Only 3% of global land mammal biomass is taken up by all other non-domesticated species, and ourselves and our livestock take up a huge amount of land. That land footprint is equivalent to the size of the entire Americas, and urban areas pale in comparison to this. Yet, for that massive investment, we get a really poor return. Because livestock add another trophic level to the food chain, most of the energy we put in is lost in conversion. So if we were able to push towards more plant-based diets, we could cut that inefficient use of land and free up space for rewilding. So in summary, the bad news is the numbers are really worrying. Biodiversity is in crisis. We don't know where some key thresholds are and we're operating in the dark. And what we've done so far clearly isn't working. The good news is that now is a great moment. There's political momentum from the COP15 on biodiversity, where we agreed to, across the world, protect 30% of land and sea area, although achieving this is yet to be seen. There's also the benefit that most biodiversity hotspots overlap with developing countries, so we would expect relatively cost-effective opportunities to be available there. 
promising solutions do exist, but we need to find them and scale, and this is where you can help. Uh, please feel free to scan the QR code where you can provide your contact details and we'll get in touch with you, or email effective.biodiversity at gmail.com. So things you can do is connect us to mentors and seed funding, join the group, you could align your career with biodiversity and feel free to discuss this with me in the office hours afterwards and you don't have to be an ecologist to make a, an important contribution here. If you're already doing some research, consider applying it to biodiversity questions yet to be answered and on an individual level, voting, campaigning and speaking to politicians is far more effective than personal decisions. Although if you are worried about personal decisions, then probably a more plant-based diet is a good way to go. Thank you so much. Cool, thank you, Alex. We have our last lightning talk now from Rowan of Family Empowerment Media, uh, one of our older charity entrepreneurship incubated charities. He works primarily on legal compliance, accounting, and system optimization as the operations manager for FEM, but also works to support FEM's hiring, research, implementation. Rowan will be talking about family planning and using mass media as an approach to reach a, a large audience at scale cost effectively. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Rowan, Operations Manager at Family Empowerment Media. We produce radio campaigns that aim to dispel the myths and misconceptions around family planning and effective forms of contraception. We do this primarily to try and improve both maternal and child health. We were founded in 2020 through the Charity Entrepreneurship Incubation Program. And in the last three years, we've had some amazing results. We've done extensive research and produced extensive radio campaigns in Kano State in northern Nigeria, where we've reached an estimated 5.6 million listeners. Uh, for the rest of this year, we are starting conducting an RCT, and we will be re-airing our content in four more states as well. I'd like to use Family Empowerment Media as a demonstration of how family planning as a cause area and how mass media campaigns as an intervention structure can be incredibly impactful. So what is the problem that our particular intervention is dealing with? Well, in the regions in which we work, there is a significant lack of access to information on contraception. The decision about when or even whether to have children is one of the most important decisions that a lot of people will make in their lives. And it also carries with it a massive health burden. For example, in Nigeria, where we primarily operate, currently one in 22 women die as a result of pregnancy or birth-related complications. A lot of these deaths could be averted if there was proper access to contraception. You could have... Uh, uh, fewer deaths as a result of fewer unwanted pregnancies and fewer deaths by increasing the intervals that space planned pregnancies. And then, so what's the solution? Well, we target the knowledge gap. So we produce uh, evidence-based, radio-based campaigns, and this process can be broken down into three stages. The first is we conduct formative research. This is where we want to learn as much about our audience as possible. We want to know about their values, their lifestyles, and more importantly, what are the knowledge barriers that are preventing them from using contraception if they're sexually active and wanting to avoid getting pregnant that are stopping them from currently taking that step? Using this research, we then enter the creative component of our work, which is producing the content. We work with a local production studio, local writers, uh, local voice actors, and a local radio station where we air our content. And throughout both of these processes, we engage stakeholders. We have a formal partnership with the Ministry of Health and we also work with local religious leaders and local organizations to ensure that all of our content is culturally sensitive. Having just given a very brief overview of what we do, I would like to discuss three reasons why I'm particularly excited about this cause area and this intervention structure combined. The first is that it's highly cost effective. In 2021, we conducted a three-month pilot campaign where we reached about 5.6 million listeners and in the middle of 2022, we got some really exciting results back about this. We found that around, uh, well, it wasn't us actually, uh, an external surveying company called PMA Data had been looking at the contraceptive prevalence rate in different areas across Nigeria. And they found that while our intervention was taking place, there was a 75% increase in contraceptive uptake. This corresponds to around 250,000 new contraceptive users. Additionally, founders pledge uh, conducted an analysis and evaluation of our intervention, and they estimated that we are operating currently 
uh, about 26 times more cost-effective than unconditional cash transfers. I'm really excited to say that just three days ago, we received some updates on this result. Rethink Priorities have just published a report where they estimate that our intervention is 60 times as cost-effective as unconditional cash transfers. So this is really exciting. If I could take this mic off, that would be my mic drop moment. But there's two other things I'm really excited about. The first is that it's evidence-driven. Our particular intervention was inspired by an RCT conducted in Burkina Faso. And then on top of this, we have been trying to contribute to the, uh, to the body of research that exists. The main, re the main way in which we're doing that is we are producing an RCT using transmitters. These replace content, specific content, which we can make to be our content, uh, in particular regions so that we can create artificial control groups. The third thing that's really exciting is it's highly scalable. This is one of the main advantages of mass media campaigns. We produce our content and air it on one radio station. If we want to reach a new audience, we re-air that content on a different radio station. And the only real cost that we incur would be the, uh, the cost of airtime in that new location. So there is minimal cost per head to scale, which means that we can reach new states in Nigeria currently, or in the future, we could scale to new countries in a very cost-effective way. I'd just like to close by telling a quick story. In 2020, one of the researchers at Charity Entrepreneurship decided to look into mass media campaigns as an intervention structure. And they looked at 180 different cause areas that mass media campaigns would be the best suited to. They selected family planning. Family Empowerment Media was born. And a little while ago, we reached out to Founders Pledge to one of their researchers called Rosie Battle and sent her our cost structure and our reach so far. She thought it was worth investigating this more, and she came back with the result that our, uh, that our campaign was around 26 times as cost-effective as unconditional cash transfers. This was a really promising result and inspired more organizations to do a further evaluations of our work. And then, as a result, we now have the really exciting result from Rethink Priorities that it might be as high as 60 times as cost-effective as unconditional cash transfers. The key thing I want to get across here is not all cost-effective interventions have been found yet. There is so much value to be found in being investigative with a lens for impact. If you're working on looking at new core areas, I hope you're inspired because there is so much potential here and who knows what the next big intervention might be. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you very much to all our Lightning Talk hosts. I hope you've enjoyed the very interesting content. I just kind of wanted to wrap up and with like an appeal to action for you all. Um, if there's one thing to take away from, or maybe two things to take away from this talk is how cool all these new cause areas that you've heard about are. And the next would be to go away and think of a cause area that's new that you might be interested in. And I've kind of put some questions to consider when looking at new cause areas on the slide here for you. So, yeah, looking at the importance of the area, who it might be relevant for, and what it could look like in practice. If you could go away and brainstorm based on these questions and come away with being excited about a new cause area, that would be a win from this session. Um, so, yes, thank you for coming. Uh, the emails for the speakers are on the screen, and if you wanted to go to their office hours to ask them more questions about their cause areas, that's happening right after this talk. I think it's next door in Keyside 2. And I guess I just wanted to pitch Charity Entrepreneurship as well. If you're interested in working in new cause areas, our next incubation program in February 2024 is focused on mass media. So as Rowan was talking about, an exciting way and an exciting approach to reach many people. And animal advocacy, preventative animal advocacy, working more at the policy level to try and impact loads of animals globally, like Mandy was talking about with Animal Policy International. So our next application round is open on July 10th and will be open until September, and you can apply to start new charities in these new cause areas, and we'll give you everything you need to start these charities. If you have any questions about research or how we come to those, uh, my email's there on the screen, and if you have any questions about what the incubation program is, then you can email Ula, whose uh, email is there, and she's also there. <laughs> um, yeah, we also have a talk by Joey tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m., who's going to yeah, talk about charity entrepreneurship and what our incubation program entails. 
And you can also take our quiz, which is the QR code on the right-hand side of the screen there, which tells you whether you'd be a good fit for starting a charity. There's also some links in the left-hand side QR code, and I think also it's the same QR code on the papers on your table, so you can learn more about our process in identifying new interventions, new core areas, and charity entrepreneurship itself also has office hours today at 5 p.m. in the East Mall. So, we're excited to see you there as well. Thank you.